Cheers. Welcome to Two Balls and a Mic. We've had a pretty active week this week, but let's not make sh- uh, make sure we don't overlook the biggest soccer team in town here in San Diego still is and remains San Diego Wave. So we actually have an insider of the league, somebody that you may know if you follow NWSL, if you follow San Diego Wave, you probably know this name. So we have a great opportunity to talk to this individual, <clears throat> founder, writer, creator, just overall badass. Jackie Gutierrez from Women Kickballs. Jackie, how are you doing? Yeah, dang. Thanks so much for the intro. I feel like uh, such a hype right there, so appreciate it. Um, yeah, super excited to be here and always love talking all things on WSL, so I'm ready for it. 100%. And, um, you know, it, it's it's just a, a literal blessing that the sport has graced us here in San Diego in such a impactful way. Uh, we were fortunate to link up with... Uh, the then San Diego NWSL uh, team, an yeah. unknown, nobody knew what the logo was or the crest or what branding, the color scheme, nothing. Um, the crest came out along with Alex Morgan also jumping on board. And so that just kind of kicked off just a, a, a crazy train of, of really good soccer action happening here in San Diego. And something that we've talked and we've been, uh, you know, we've met up with Jackie at wave games and and in particular we, we talked a little bit before too is we're new to this just like we were new to the at usl it professional soccer came to us mm-hmm. and we're trying to learn who we have fortunately on the nwsl side not only do they have a new state-of-the-art stadium which the fact that we have credentials for that i'm still like <laughs> sweet um but we have really good players world-class players here in our own backyard um, but Jackie, uh, just to start off, just for some of our n- listeners, can you just kind of give an overview of, of where you stand at this point in your career, having launched an independent magazine, Women Kickballs, first edition, um, a great, uh, just incredible work that we've seen you just develop throughout this last year. Uh, but just kind of fill us in with some of that info, if you would. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, it's been a wild ride. So for me, I actually started pursuing sports journalism at 17 years old, which always throws people off because they still think I'm 17, but it's been about eight years now. And so um, I've kind of gone through a few different phases and transitions in my career. So I started out just writing for different sports publications, getting a lot of experience before and during college. And then in 2019, I branched out and created Woman Kickballs. And I'm a one woman show and I, I like it that way as well. So it's just me, myself and I, and I still write articles and have an audience of email subscribers, which has been really fun to interact with as well. But now also on the business side of things, I've kind of transitioned in that aspect too. So, um, you know, when I first started out Woman Kickballs, I was still in college and um, had different jobs in marketing departments and PR firms and things like that. And so I have a lot of just different skills from those backgrounds, but I was always working in other industries and Woman Kickballs was kind of a side thing. So I've been around for the league a long time and of course covering the national team as well. But just this past May, I went and branched out again, fully freelance. And so now Woman Kickballs is my full-time job, which is exciting. It's challenging. I'm still figuring out so much too. But a big part of that is I basically took the two worlds of my media marketing skills and then combining it to women kick balls in the sense of having clients in the soccer world as well. So helping different sports organizations. And yeah, when I took on this kind of freelance role, I remember getting my first paycheck from one of my gigs and I was like really discouraged because it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And I remember driving home and just like, man, this sucks. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And I really had that like, yeah, just moment where I was doubting my career and and my decisions, which I feel like kind of happens pretty often. But that was the first time I was really just down about it. And anyways, I started thinking about what has brought me joy in my career. And I actually got my master's degree in journalism from the University of Oregon. So I did that during a COVID year. And during that time, I had this magazine design class and I loved it. So my idea to create a magazine on the two latest teams in Southern California was super random. And so that's just kind of how that project burst. And I went to 27 
NWSL games this season, which is crazy going from zero to 27 in one season, taking photos and just meeting so many people like you guys and and others as well. And so, yeah, it's been a pretty wild journey, but it's been fun. My biggest thing is always just trying to make news accessible. I think in the soccer world, especially when I started out and even as a consumer and as a fa- early fan, when I was trying to learn about the sport, I always noticed that there were paywalls um, when you try to look for articles. So you try to read something and you only get the first one or two sentences, maybe a paragraph if they're being nice. And then you have to get a, like you get a pop up ad and you have to pay for it. And I have always been a big believer that if you want to grow the women's game, we need to make it accessible to everyone. And so in doing that, people, when they subscribe to my website, get quality news i'm in the same rooms as big name journalists too um but also they get connections with me in that i love sending out a handwritten note and a sticker whenever someone subscribes so that's kind of just a connection part that i enjoy building with people who want to follow along on this journey so yeah that's a little bit about how things got started and then of course having two teams here has just been really fun so there's lots happening in the nebby cell that's for sure and that's honestly the beauty of having your own thing going on, right? Like we have two balls in a mic and we've talked about it where what if like ESPN or some big company ever approaches us and says, hey, like we want you guys or something like that. But having your own thing is so beautiful because you get those connections. Like you mm-hmm. send those letters out to every single subscriber and that's honestly great. At the end of the day, what is your ultimate goal when it comes to women kickball? Where, how far do you see this going? Where do you want eventually women kickballs to get to? Well, I think, of course, building up the email subscriber base has always been my goal. So I've had this goal just for the past, I don't know, few months. But basically, by the end of 2023, I want to reach 5,000 email subscribers, which I'm a little over halfway of doing. So i um, excited about that. Um, and then, of course, just building up the clients and the relationship aspect as well with different people in the soccer world. So um, I'm sure eventually at one point or another, well, I can eventually try to monetize some of the content or ads on my website. That's a whole nother ball game too. Cause um, again, it's just me, myself and I, and there's so many different avenues of how yeah. I, can, I can approach women kick balls, but even to just some of the opportunities of working on a freelance basis is really nice. So um, yeah, just working with whoever kind of, you know, where the, wherever there's like a just similar alignments in terms of my values and the work that's being presented, then I'm all for it. So, um, yeah, like my goal would be to work with the NWSL in some capacity in one way or another. So, um, we'll see what happens. That's definitely a long shot, but I also thought that getting 500 email subscribers was a long <laughs> shot when I first started. I remember my uncle like encouraged me to reach that milestone and I was like, I don't know, this seems really crazy and impossible. And then sure enough, in a year I reached that and that was so blown away. So I know my high school self is always just amazed and and grateful for that. But another thing too is like I also want to be just kind of the voice in the soccer space that I didn't have growing up. So sure. as a young Hispanic female, I'm oftentimes the youngest person in the room and whether it's a press conference or some sort of meeting, whatever it is. And so I'm noticing that change a little bit, which is great. But yeah, I wish my younger self had someone to learn from or knew that this even career option was possible. Of course, as you guys know, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it when you're building your own thing. Yeah. But I think just the people that you meet and the different opportunities that come around is definitely exciting. And um, I feel like saying like makes it worth it is weird, but in a way, <laughs> it's just like a really cool moment where you see your work just um yeah, like paying off or kind of just being recognized in a sense. But um, yeah, I think the community aspect is is definitely a huge thing that I've always enjoyed being a part of. Well, we recently had a, a similar type of event where, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to finally get paid in some sort of way through a job that we got as uh, broadcasting indoor soccer, right? And yeah, so congratulations. For, That's you, awesome. Appreciate that. And so like for the past couple of years, you know, we've been doing this three years here in my house, in my garage, the build, the electric bill doesn't pay itself. The internet has to be fast <laughs> to a degree. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my parents were like, oh, well, I'm, I'm told I'm, I'm doing this. Like, oh, are you getting paid now? Well, no, it's not. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We got we got a, you know, we got a, a paycheck from from doing this gig. And it was like, oh, is, are they paying you for this? Yes, they are. And so it doesn't matter how much it is. And I'm pretty sure that you had maybe a similar experience where it's like, well, it's something, something. And it's not even about that something, because I think unilaterally something that I've seen and, and, and really enjoyed as far as NWSL and, and the women's game in general, um, 
being able to go and, and see it live and uh, the Cholos right across the border too. That's, that's something special to, to be able to have that too. A different, different flavor of the same thing that we have just mm -hmm. iterated with, you know, I mean, the Cholas can, can, can hang with anybody in the world. Like I'm comparing now and I see the players that, mm -hmm. I, that, that, you know, like wave have like a Sofia Jacobs. I'm like, she's a world breaker. But then I look in over at uh, me official in, in Tigres, uh, we have uh, uh, Christina Birkin wrote over there. We're like, Montero, yeah. they're amazing too. Like, oh, where has this all been? And um, just to digress, it's it's a it's a really good just love for the genuine love for the game that I'm experiencing and seeing. And I think that ultimately is what's going to have to persevere. And at the end, that's that's what we're here for. And and you know, we can grow, say, grow the game. And yeah, but let's just do that. Grow the game. It doesn't matter, you know. If it's males playing, females playing, whatever, kids playing, it's the game. And I think that ultimately um, is what that genuine factor is by knowing what it takes to start off from the bottom. And mm -hmm. you don't take those things for granted. And so that's really cool just to just to be able to, to do that. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, it's just a lot of hard work. Um, and, you know, being in this now eight years, a lot of times people see me on the sidelines or on social media and they think, oh, like – you haven't made or whatever. And it's like, no, I still, yeah, live with my parents and I'm hoping to, you know, make a, make a career out of this because a lot of time on the media aspect and being that my business is focused on offering services, people think, you know, I could just take photos for free and that pays the bills or whatever it is. And, um, as a woman too, it's like, you don't always get those paid opportunities because we often are just seen as minority or, not as valuable in our work or what we bring to the table. And so it's always a challenge, but it's also something that I've really resonated with some of the players too, of seeing how for years they fought for equal pay and fought for their voices to be heard. And so um, although I am usually the youngest in the room, I also <laughs> can relate to them in a very unique way too, which I feel like um, just goes a long way in that I've been telling people too, as I've been just so involved with some of the soccer stuff recently but for me it's always about the people and making sure that the players stories are told and that they're also seeing in the light of who they are as a person because I think they're of course more than just players they have great talent but at the end of the day too um, who they are as people goes a long way so yeah that's awesome that you guys are, are able to relate to that too yeah so when it comes to NWSL and relating to the players obviously a lot of part a lot of it is, comes down to the game right so what would you say are your strengths when it comes to Knowing the game, the tactics, individual players on what their play style would be, what would you feel like your strengths are when it comes to just handing out that knowledge to people? Well, I think it's different because I cover all 12 teams. So I know sometimes, I mean, being that I am in California, it's nice to have two teams here. I feel like actually that's something I want to grow in is more of the player tactics and formations just because – I do things from a lot of different perspectives of someone who does, who interviews players, who also has clients where I offer public relations services to in the soccer world. And then of course, analyzing the game and the storytelling format and what that looks like. Um, and then of course, from a photography perspective of trying to get those shots and being sure to track what players are where on the field and different things like that. So there's a few moving parts to it um, for sure. But I think what I love about this league is that although there's 12 teams, I'm learning it's such a small world within the players and the coaches within that of everyone who knows each other and just what that looks like. So I think, yeah, covering 12 teams is really fun. It keeps me very, very busy because it's not just news on San Diego Wave or Angel City. It's mm -hmm. news on everything and the league itself. And especially coming out of this just joint investigation findings, obviously that's very heavy stuff. And so I think, um, you know, I look at these stories and these different challenging things, the highs and the lows. And I always try to ask myself um, what kind of value or what kind of conversations can I bring to the table and what kind of questions can I help uh, answer versus creating new questions or just repeating information that's already been said because and the journalist hat and the journalist mindset, you also want to try to bring those new perspectives to the table in a way where it's still quality reporting too. So yeah, there's a few different aspects to think about. So I can't give a definite answer to that, <laughs> but um, yeah, definitely a few different hats that I wear and that's kind of the fun part of it too. And yeah, I mean, and and you touched on it a little bit, right? Like there, this league, it, it's not all rainbows and sunshines, just like any sports league. But um, it's hopefully in moving into a direction where again, these players take center stage, the play takes center stage, and 
and again, from from investigating on on our own and coming into this, we see some of the invest the papers that are coming out, and and it's just it's great that we're moving in a direction and purging some of these people, the old the old guard, and I think we're coming into it in, uh, two balls. We're just coming into this as far as this is a time of shift, a, a, a time where things seem to be moving in that and trending in that direction. Um, do you think? there is there's still more growth to be had in that sense and or, or what else can needs to happen in order for the players in order for the play in order for the league in order for the beautiful game to be what takes center stage in this oh yeah that's i feel like i can give you such a long answer because i think there are so many different aspects of where improvement can be made i think the first thing and and something that the league has addressed is that they're going through this in a few different stages of you know, exposing the truth, bringing about corrective action, and then, of course, putting all that into play and creating a systematic change within the league as well. And so when you look at those three phases, we're obviously still very much in phases one and two, whereas I think right now, like all these coaches and the abusers in the league um, who were mentioned in these reports, like they get to walk away almost like just with – with like no kind of real consequences and that's very frustrating. And so I think, um, you know, there needs to be accountability for those actions and, and what they've done because it's not just to the league as a whole, but obviously to so many players and teams and just individuals who've had to deal with trauma and then are now trying to still do their job as an athlete where these coaches are completely removed from the situation and from the league. And they kind of don't really have anything to worry about. And some of them are still being hired too, or some of them are still around soccer at the youth level. And so I think there's a lot of different aspects or protocols that need to be put into play. Um, you know, I don't come from the league side of knowing all the protocols and the details, but I think um, that's for sure something where accountability and, you know, whether it's both the NWSL and the NWSL Players Association or just either or, um, I think having them really advocate for the players and um, trying to put either some legal, you know, action into play is, yeah. is needed too. And of course, that's a whole nother thing where it takes time and, and you know, people have to consent to that, whatever. But I think seeing some real accountability is a huge thing. And then, of course, I think communication as well with players, with teams, with the media. I think the league talks a lot about trying to build that trust with the media, but you don't always see that. And so, um, yeah, I think there's a few different aspects as to what that looks like. But I think having this truth be exposed as heartbreaking and as disgusting as it is, I think yeah. it does need to, to be out there. Um, so hopefully this is like, you know, in the sense, the worst of it, I think it's definitely a huge growing pain um, because it's important for it to be out there. But now moving forward, that's, you know, it kind of feels not impossible, but it feels like a lot at once to figure out. So I'm sure we'll probably see more action plans or hopefully more communication on the leagues and as to what that actually looks like. And just to think during the season, right? Like the players, the the coaches, the staff, aren't shying away from these conversations either. I mean, Casey Stoney, from what I've, from what I've gotten to, to know about Casey Stoney, she's, she's very direct and to the point and she'll let you know. Um, and you know, with the growth, there's just growth in so many different directions. Like you said, so many important directions, but even in directions where you would take for granted, even in, in other sports. Right. And I remember something that kind of took me aback was when San Diego wave traveled away to Seattle for the first time. And they were just talking about the deplorable conditions of, of where they stayed. And it was just unacceptable. Some of the things that the, these players go through, the travel and the the amenities aren't up to par for the level of quality of the athletes themselves. And so it, that's, that's just, you know, another layer to a, a bigger picture, hopefully, where all these things get taken care of. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's 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 – awfully difficult to ask those questions sometimes and and uh i'm just i know you have a question too right now chiva but do you ever have that thought in the back of of your mind when you're asking these tough questions as an independent media what if what if i ask the wrong question and somebody gets upset and because you're not necessarily shielded by a big you know three-letter sports name uh like a fox or espn at any point they can just be like okay, we're just going to limit this a little bit. Is that ever cross your mind or you're just 
No. Great. <laughs> well, so, so to give you some context, in my master's degree or master's program, like I literally had classes on reporting and interviewing techniques. And so, um, you know, I studied and have learned a lot from some of those classes, which I remember going into it being like, oh, like, why are we going to spend so much time on classes about asking questions and whatnot? Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> it makes sense. And so I've learned and grown a lot in that way. And I think one of the biggest aspects when it comes to being a journalist or any sort of interview interviewer is really just reading the room and so it's about all about how you ask the question and the context either that you do provide when asking that question or just again reading the room and what the situation is like so I'm never fearful of people shutting me down because I think um Again, I come from a PR site too, so I know um, how to frame questions in a way that either are going to make people look good or, um, yeah, that might put them on the spot, but it's a necessary question. And, um, you know, the league has their own PR people and teams, of course, as well. So, you know, they get trained on how to answer questions. It's very common. Um, It's nothing that scares me, but I think by being independent, I actually have the freedom to be able to ask questions because I'm not asking people to put them on a spot and make them look bad. I'm asking them because I want to have accountability across the league as a whole. So for example, with the joint investigation report, um, you know, you saw certain big name media outlets who had access to that report early yeah. on ahead of time. Yeah. That's all uh, also referred to as an embargo. And so they have a deal with someone within the league of, you know, we'll give you this document ahead of time. You have X amount of time to review it and craft a story, but you have to release that story, you know, on this just like no um you can't release it ahead of time so they give you yeah. a deadline as well and when you can do that and my you know thought when i saw that was you hear the league directly talking about building trust with the media but how are you going to do that when you have these little side gates of different deals with big and they're all big name publications and i know some of those people as well so it's no knock to them because you know i get it you want you're getting to get your story out but it's also contradictory in that you know, when the league wants to do a lot of rebuilding and you're giving this embargo to big name publications who aren't consistently covering the sport, it just shows a lot. And so my biggest thing is like just showing up. And I think people, you know, see my name, my face, they know women kick balls, they know what I'm about. And I'm all about growing the league and amplifying the players. So um, I've never had any weird experiences of like coaches or players like being uncomfortable with my questions. Um, so I mean, fingers crossed that, you know, stays that way. But um, I feel like I kind of know how to read the room a little bit more. And I wasn't always that way. I remember being super nervous when I first started getting into <laughs> press conferences. And actually, my very first interview in a press conference was with Jill Ellis when she was still with the national team. Oh, wow. And I remember asking her a question. And sometimes when I get nervous or excited, I'll stutter. And I remember I asked this question and she goes, I'm so sorry. I couldn't catch that. Can you repeat the question? I'm like, oh, dang, like seriously, I got to do this again because I was so nervous. And so like I think about that situation and how much it's changed from where I'm at now. And sure, sometimes I get nervous or whatever, but I think now I have a better kind of just understanding of how that works. Um, again, just with the PR and journalism side of things. So that's definitely helped a lot. But um, yeah, press conferences and interviews, it's always that's actually one of my favorite things is getting to ask players questions and also just getting to know them as people in those situations, too. Man, I feel that because my English sucks. So whenever I'm asking <laughs> questions, and he always makes fun of me because English is my Relax. second language. So mine too. <laughs> uh, but my my accent is terrible. But anyway, I kind of want to segue a little bit more into obviously San Diego Wave, just because we're based out of San Diego. But with that, I want to touch first on your magazine. Congratulations on the magazine. That's great. I know yeah, it focuses a lot you. on LA and San Diego. But talk to us a little bit of what was the inspiration behind it, and ultimately how everything has been going on after you were able to execute this project. Yeah, so it was definitely a big project because it was all like stuff that I produced. I didn't have a team of people or writers or editors or marketers like it's all me. So, um, you know, and I'm not a business person in the sense of like numbers always intimidate me. So when I'm creating different uh, sponsorship packages for this magazine, for advertisers and whatnot, it's just like super crazy. I'm like, wow, people trust me with their money or like, you know, want to give me money to place an ad in this magazine. Like this is so wild. So I was learning more on that sense of just some of the kind of dynamics of how that really works because I've done magazine and design projects before, but not to this extent. So yeah, these 40 pages, it's been really cool just to see people get excited about it. I mentally am like, I don't want to look at this thing anymore, but I know like, you know, in the off season, people are getting to relive some of their favorite experiences 
experiences. So, um, yeah, a lot of it is uh, just different aspects within the game and outside of the game too. So I tried to literally divide all of the story categories equally between each team. So you'll see in there just different aspects of, um, you know, players' favorite local spots in San Diego or LA or um, focusing on the fan areas as well and the supporter group sections that each team has. And then, of course, I did player features from uh, each team and that was really great and then just kind of highlighting um, some of the ways that each team is impacting the future of the game too and then of course the overall highlights so yeah there's lots in that for sure um, but yeah I'll be like I don't know whether or not I'm going to do another magazine so this may be like the first and last um, time for people to get a magazine so um, yeah that was definitely a fun project it has to be a huge undertaking like I I I think shudder to think, right? Uh, sometimes we have little things that, like I, I'm dreading a interview we have later with uh, one of the goalkeepers that's in Spain right now, and it's completely in Spanish. And I did two minutes of subtitles on on something two years ago, and I was like, nope, that's just that's <laughs> how it is. They're gonna have to learn Spanish, and so just the minutia of that taking so long, I, I just that undertaking, and just just the the work that I had to take and 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 again having a front row seat to it too because you know you, you hustle at the games like up and people who were at usd know this that hill <laughs> i'm so glad that at least one team got out of that uh, usd <laughs> because that hill is is yeah, it's brutal <laughs> t- it's killer um but o- overall um i think this is a, a great thing to have is is that physical aspect to it you know it's almost like having vinyl and and and, and just you can say you can see the craftsmanship and, and the work it took because, I mean, to have access to the players like this, to have access to Kristen Press, uh, up who's an up-and-comer, and, and Morgan, a, fa- a world-established uh, megastar, uh, to your disposal. I mean, it, it, was that just like dream come true? Or is that like, okay, this is what's, this is my new normal now, and this is wh- they're, they're my co-workers in a sense in some sort of way? I think it's just the normal. That's part of like being in the media. And I think with COVID, I really saw that, um, yeah, just front and center because while everything went virtual, um, you know, being in California, not having teams before then, I just took advantage of Zoom meetings because I got to have connections and access to you coaches across the country and players across the country. So, yeah, it is crazy because they are definitely big names, Kristen Press and Alex Morgan and different things like that. But I feel like for me, it's, it's, it is my new normal, but I also um, don't take those moments for granted because I just know that, um, again, my high school self is always amazed that that even happens. So um, it's just something that I want to like always appreciate and, and uh, yeah, just take in. But it's also my job, too. So um, I think just finding that balance of both is like what's important in some of those situations. Yeah, so with, with all that, like let's dive into San Diego Wave a little bit. Just kind of want to take your take on – Take your take. <laughs> Get your take on what some of your favorite <laughs> players were from San Diego Wave this first season. Man, I think there's like so many really cool aspects of the Wave and what they're doing. I was definitely impressed by Morgan. I mean, obviously, I've covered her for a long time, but I've never really gotten to know her as personally as I did this season. But seeing her goal, like the Golden Boot, um, just record that she set was so yeah. insane. Like, um, you know, that 4-0 game that they crushed Gotham and she scored all four goals. Like, that was just so wild. So um, I think some of those things are very impressive, just seeing – like the caliber that she's at and just what that looks like from her on the performance level was like a whole nother thing. And then obviously with the team getting Jaden Shaw, that was a really good milestone of seeing such a young player. And then of course her being able to match that performance too with her goals and just her in her debut games as well. And so I think some of those were some of the players that really stood out for me. And then of course with them, moving in a snapdragon i think that just added like a whole nother level of excitement for the wave and for just fans around the sport in the nwso so yeah i feel like people are just hungry for the game and it's really exciting to see and you also see that too in the attendance records of the nwso reached a million fans this season which yeah. is amazing and then of course the championship game i mean the way we're so close to even getting to that too in their first season and that game uh was streamed on like you know one of the biggest um networks and it had 915,000 viewers as well so 
there's just always milestones. And I think seeing that front row with the wave and just as the, with the league as a whole, um, it's really cool just to see like what's next, because I feel like California has set the bar with some of these playing environments. So um, I feel like it's going to be hard for other, you know, teams maybe to keep up with. I don't know. So yeah, it's definitely exciting. The wave says did such a good job at partnering up with um, surf um, mm-hmm. and, and just, just really harnessing that, the power of the youth academies and, and youth soccer and really early in a in really good way where I wish uh, the counterparts uh, on the male side with San Diego Loyal and the USL did a little bit more of, and, 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 you know, it's, it's, you could see it re- reflected in, in the fans too. Um, it's really interesting. The environment that NWSL has, and we've commented about this a couple of times where it's not necessarily rowdy 90 minutes, but the people are smart. They know what's happening on the pitch. They're breaking down the plays as it happens. My favorite part is that uh, you'll see little girls on the sideline with trading cards, and they'll show you, oh, this is my favorite one because, yeah, she may she might be a substitute for the Red Stars, but her stats are this and this and this, and she played the here, here, here. And uh, what? Like, this is, this is great. This is what I like seeing is the game is just so organic, and I think they did such a good job with – with marketing to the, those individuals and have that, you know, next generation already set up, ready to go. Um, real quick with Morgan, my favorite part of Morgan's entire season was how she, I don't know how she did it. She did 120 minutes when she was in, shit said to be questionable to even play in the playoffs here at home. And she ran the entire match. She was tired, but I've never been able to see an athlete just push through and persevere to a level in that degree. She was, she was tired. I don't know if you remember Jackie, that, that, that match where it was opening, the opening game. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just how they are. That's how they're built. I feel like it's just a whole different thing because that's what I love about these athletes too, is that they just find a way to persevere and yeah. Seeing those young fans, like that's, that's what they get to show them too and be that example of just, going for it um I mean that's kind of like how I got into soccer too and and the mindset that I adopted from my time playing as a kid and watching the game and learning about the end of ESO, um when I was in high school even and so um I feel like that's just the tone that they set and it's really cool just to see how it evolves because it doesn't just impact obviously the amount of goals that they score on the field but it impacts literally the next generation as they get to just see that like front and center so I think that's been the fun part of some of these atmospheres at like the bank of California. And of course, Snapdragon is just the environment, but then of course seeing the players and just how they like literally give it all in the field. So I know that sounds so basic to say, but mm-hmm. like, it's so true. No, and I, I, I really enjoy what the, the product of it, right. With all the pageantry and then everything just put together. It's, it's, it's honestly like top notch world-class sports and just sports in general. Yeah, and then you have players like Jaden Shaw, right? Up and coming talent. Where for her to be in San Diego Wave, I know there was a soul, is she gonna get traded and all this stuff that happened, but ultimately lands in San Diego Wave. Mm-hmm. And that you probably know her a little better than us. What what's what's your ceiling? Could she potentially be the greatest player that we see for the United States? You're talking about Jaden Shaw? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, she's been like on fire. Um but I mean, obviously you see like her and Alyssa Thompson, some of these younger players mm-hmm. that are, you know, coming in and that are just like, I feel like almost just getting their feet wet because now they have these veteran players to learn from. But I mean, just seeing Jaden's performance and what that looks like, I don't know. It's going to be dangerous. That's what I know. Um, So yeah, we'll see what happens there, but definitely seeing this next generation grow and um, just, yeah, they're so skilled. It's ridiculous. Like I'm always just blown away at them. So um, who knows what next season we'll have in store. That's the interesting part about NWSL, right? There's 12 teams. So the parody is, is, is there some teams like last year, Gotham kind of fell off a, a cliff at some point, but for the most part, everybody was in it and had a chance to make playoffs. So mm-hmm. it's really exciting. Um, and some of these players that are here are featured in uh, the national team now. And, just obviously, let's say Kaylin Sheridan for Canada is is is. I, I wish she was here, either in the U.S. or, or Mexico or just mm-hmm. anywhere but Canada. Like man, they have they have a really good player up there, and like some of those 
stops that she made those that penalty save and and that's singular one? and it should be plural actually is is mm -hmm. you know just a testament of her just natural ability to to be great but Naomi Gurma Naomi Gurma is something special like the IQ that this individual has is is off the charts especially for her age and I, I think you know the U.S. has a really good player in her. San Diego Wave has a really good player in her. Wore the captain's band at, uh, at some point here at some San Diego Wave. Is she really the, the future? The, the you know the real deal Holyfield for the U.S. Women's National Team at this point. Oh yeah, Naomi Grimmer, man, uh, so wild. I actually did a exclusive story feature on her in the magazine, so um, that's definitely a good piece in that. But like, even just getting to talk to her several times this season and and just seeing her growth, I mean. For a player to get NWSL Rookie of the Year and Defender of the Year is just so insane. And then, of course, for like Casey to get the coach NWSL Coach of the Year award too. I mean, you just see that dynamic of the leadership role that Casey's setting the tone for her team. And obviously, Naomi Naomi uh, was a rookie this past season, and so for her to like literally just learn from the best and have all of that insight and wisdom just streamed into her, I think. Um, you just really saw how she absorbed all of that, but then also was able to display that on the field with, yeah, wearing the captain's armband or um, just her performance level was like such, like such an incredible thing to witness. Um, so I'm always blown. Like, I know I should like, I, mean, I know how good Naomi Grimma is, but like every time I feel like I'm just blown away because you're like, whoa, that was insane. And so um, like she's been such a fun player to watch too. And I think now she gets to set the tone, not just for the wave, but even with the national team as she's starting in games as well. I mean, we just saw that, um, you know, the other night with uh, the USA versus New Zealand game. And so I think just to see her level and the caliber of who she is as a player um, be distributed into both club and uh her you know the level for the national team is just so wild um but it's exciting for her too i know casey always mentions that um naomi's you know a better um center back than she ever was which i just always think is funny but like um yeah she's she's a real deal that's for sure and if people aren't watching her or don't know her name like they need to to figure it out google it because um she's not just an incredible player and um has great performances but also just such a nice human being too um so she's just well-rounded i think such a great fit for the wave so it'd be really cool just to see what she's going to be like in her second season now that she kind of has um just some experience under her belt too it's really rare like in american sports that do have drafts where the number one overall pick ends up panning out exactly if not better than anybody ever expected and i think naomi Gurma is is, oh, yeah. is is an excellent choice of a first round pick uh, as good as you can get so great great scouting uh by uh, oh, yeah. san diego wave and the team there um but naomi corniak morgan um the three that have for the most part made a couple of appearances and call had calls for the national team a national team that went over to europe not too long ago and had a couple of difficult games losing against England and then Spain, I believe. Um, 2023, we have a world cup coming up. So is every, is everything okay uh, with the national team? Is, is it just other teams are getting better? Cause that's something that I have noticed is other teams like Barcelona's team is amazing to watch. Uh, Chelsea's team, my team is amazing to watch. Um, but Obviously, is the world catching up to the U.S.? <laughs> I don't know. It's tough because they did have that, uh, you know, I think it was like a three-game losing streak, yeah, towards the end of last year. The other team was Germany that they lost yes. to, which Germany is just, gosh, they're, they're so machine. insane. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can't expect anything less, but, yeah, definitely gave the U.S. a run for their money when they, you know, won 2-1. But I think the challenge is, like, you see some of that, that, that losing streak from last year and then you know this year you wonder like how is that going to affect just their performance or what does that look like with it being a world cup year um and to be honest i don't know i think one of their biggest things is consistency and trying to find just kind of that right formula for their opponents because you even saw in the recent game where like taylor corniak's position was like just different than we normally see her yeah. in terms of like the sixth role and whatnot and so 
I don't know, like there's just a lot, I feel like the questions that you can ask or kind of try to figure out of what does this look like? How does this impact the game? Because realistically, they have to figure it out sooner than later because, you know, this year they have seven more games until the World Cup, mm-hmm. which isn't a lot of time on the national team level. So um, I, I'm not a coach. I can't speak for what that looks like in terms of Laco's position. But what I do know is that creating that roster is going to be such a huge challenge because you have so many players to choose from, Mm -hmm. but then there's also injuries like, for example, with Megan Rapinoe's recent absence um, in some of these friendlies because of that, but leading up to it, it's just going to be something where I feel like there's going to be so much at stake in terms of the players and just the performance that they have to like, kind of like put out and not prove, but yeah, in a sense they have to like, you know, really show that Blocko is making the right decision for, for these big games of the world cup uh, stage. So it's going to be wild. I honestly feel like they're going to, you know, do pretty good in the beginning, but maybe struggle. And mm-hmm. if they prove me wrong, then I'm glad. But um, <laughs> I just, yeah, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. We'll see. I'm planning to go to that. So maybe that I'll uh, have live updates. I don't know. But yeah, it'll be exciting. Yeah. I mean, that's that's awesome. So you're planning on going to a World Cup coming up? Yeah. Yeah. First World Cup. So I have lots of planning to do because in my mind, um 2023 felt so far away and like we're already in january you know so yeah i have to sit down and figure out some of those things um because being self-employed you have to fund that trip yourself and um you know hope i get sponsors along the way or whatever but uh it's definitely a different route compared to just a big name you know company sending you out so who knows maybe more working opportunities will come in terms of the collaboration aspects or different formats of content creation i don't know but um yeah it's definitely a big deal so excited because the last world cup um our last two actually in 2015 i was still in high school so i was pretty (laughs) young to like just go on my own and like go to canada but yeah really like uh just excited and looking forward to this one perfect and honestly i i wish you the best of luck because i mean that's essentially the ultimate goal for us too is, is to make it to a world cup and uh if I mean, if somehow we win the lottery and make it to 2023, I'm, I'll, we'll see you there. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, I want to just thank you again for taking your uh, time to come in and educate us a little bit more. I'd, I'd love to keep diving into the league, the players as the season goes, if if that's aligns in our stars. But definitely want to go ahead and and check out everything at Women Kickballs. Uh, I know this is the link tree that has pretty much everything. Uh, is there anything else anywhere else where they can find you or your work or where you'd like people to go ahead and check you out? No, you guys pretty much got it down. Yeah. All, I feel like all the basic social media stuff of Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok, YouTube. I've been doing more video content this year too. So every Friday I publish a new video on YouTube. And then if people want like some more one-on-one info where I share all the tea and give you a behind the scenes aspect of my life. Um, I have a Patreon channel too, so that's a thing, but yeah, those are pretty much the main spots. And then yeah, people want free sticker, free trading card. They can always get that when they subscribe. So um, yeah, there you go. You got it. You know what's up. So yeah, that's kind of just all the different um, ways that people can get involved. So appreciate you all. Um, yeah. Showing some interest in the end of yourself as a whole and, and wanting to learn more. I feel like that's always the best place to be too. So yeah. Oh man, that was a rough hair day right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely ch- just support everything soccer and you do a fantastic job and and have the integrity of the game in 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 heart and in mind so appreciate that 100 percent um just want to stick around and we'll have a just little closing comments and i'll stop recording right now cool sounds good perfect boom